Kyle did, or uh, Connor did tell me that. Can we lock this so no? Okay, cool. <laughs> Connor did tell me that. Just you, he said, he, he, I, when I talked to you right before, like last night and night before, he said the Ukrainian episode. Mm -hmm. He said, man, it got really heavy. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm looking for something light. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It, okay. it, it was intense, wasn't it? <laughs> really intense. So wait, so we got to skip the Gulf War stories? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, he was talking about like how when he was younger, he was like forming Molotov cocktails to fight in the Ukrainian revolution. And like, it was a crazy story, man. And he and he had such a calmness about him with it, too. He's just incredibly grateful. I mean, Kyle works with the guy, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's gonna get blown up. It'll all be okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can just put like some sort of a compressor in post, right? Cool. No problem, man. Got it. Is th is that a good okay. length? You want us to do a test? Okay. Well, we're but, not, no, we're not gonna man handle them. I'm saying. No, it's just. But how do we sound? We sound good. This is cool. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Do you need me to do a double clap to sync? Oh, Gio. One thing I do want to say before we start is in post, I've I've consistently had to drag the audio up like five milliseconds. They've all been laggy. Okay. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll see if it, if it continues, but yeah, I'll I'll see it. Okay. Cool. You're the man. All right. Three, two, one. Said hike. Double clap signifies the start of an episode. And before I introduce our guest on my left, camera's right. I want to address where we are in a brand new studio. And this one actually does feel like the simulation, to be honest with you. I don't know if you guys believe in simulation theory, but <laughs> I'm pretty heavy on it. And again, before I introduce our guests, I'd like to introduce everybody in the room today. Let's start with our special guest. Please come up to the mic and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Carly Mandel. You guys. Aspiring podcaster, potentially. Carly. And she has a really good idea for her show. I think she should do it. Next. Kyle Herbert. I am a podcast producer, producer, engineer, uh, all around. Guy's got about a, a new job title every time we run an episode. <laughs> Last week he was saying he was an actor. I'm not even kidding. All right, and who's over here? Uh, this is Killian Don. I'm an author. I'm co-producer on the show. And who's engineering the episode today? Gio. Great. Thank Gio. you, Gio. Gio, thank you for being war ready today. And I will say, Kill had quite the night last night. Normally he's um very quick witted and sharp, but if not, <laughs> it's because he drank a lot last night, <laughs> which most young people do in LA on Friday night. Yeah. There you go. Now, on my left again, I thought I was just going to interview you today, but then last minute he said it wouldn't be right if I didn't bring my partner, man. <laughs> so I have both Cyrus Forrest and Ethan Reef. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Connor. Yeah, thanks for the last minute invite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he was on the fence about inviting. Him. He's, he's like, ah, oh, he'll probably be pissed if I don't invite him. That's not true. Wow, I don't think he said that. I invited but you last week or whatever. I don't yeah. know. Come on. You're you're an instigator. I am yeah. during the pocket tour. Trying to instigate. Hey, can I jump in and do something messed up? Go ahead. So, what kind of stuff do you write? I know that's not what you were going to. No, work. get get on the mic. Go ahead, dude. Okay, go. Uh, so I've written written three books in the last five years: two fiction, one nonfiction. The nonfiction is my most recent one. Wow, what the two novels? Th three novels. Yeah. Well, the first one's like a novella. It's quite small. Wait, but so you count the nonfiction as a novel? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's so. Oh, I forgot. It's twenty twenty two. It's like a fic. It's so. <laughs> it's uh. It's basically, it's, it's about a scandal, uh, like a real life scandal that happened quite recently. There's a lot of lawsuits going on, so I had to slightly fictionalize it. So it's oh, technically okay. a novel, but it is, it's, it's non-fiction. It's, okay. it's all true. I just changed names. For legal places. purposes. For legal purposes, wow. right. The not That's get awesome. sued version of the book. That's cool. Now, I will tell you what I've learned about Killian's workflow, because after I had made my movie in Boston, I was like, I got to get a writer on board. Killian wrote the next screenplay. He writes very manically, so he'll like 
bang out 18 hour days if he's on an idea are you guys kind of the same way with when you guys write or uh not anymore we, there was a period remember uh was it mary exes one of our very first scripts we wrote i think we wrote it over a week well ago. it was one of our very first assignments it wasn't an original piece of material right, it was a the job. situation where we were hired by a in this case a producer director who was really successful in the commercial world in new york city and he wanted to make a movie and he just decided he, he had enough money he'd like do it on his own screw the hollywood or whatever right and one thing led to another and we got the job to sort of like write his movie for him and then like size saying we wrote it really fast <laughs> but I mean, it was good it was it was really good but it was like i think that's the quickest we ever wrote something i mean i think i feel like we wrote that over like literally two or three days of full feature. No, it wasn't. Play. It wasn't quite. It was like a week, it was. A week. Uh, it was no. quick. I think it was. His quick. memory always makes things like even more, you know, Is dramatic or <laughs> even cooler. Or... That's why you guys have had longevity in this industry. <laughs> but I guess my point is that when we were younger, if the circumstances, you know, you sometimes find yourself in situations like that. When we were doing, we were doing a series that we did for Showtime years ago called sleeper cell and we had a situation where we had a, a writing staff and a, and a writer had turned in uh a script and it really just he had turned it in late and it really wasn't very good at all and the two of us and i think the show had to start shooting or prepping or it was a few days away from prep it was, it, it was gonna shoot on, on like a monday and we basically stayed in the office all that weekend doing a page one rewrite of that episode. And again, it wasn't by choice. It was, okay, this thing has to be ready to go on Monday, and there's we just have to do it. So that's so. not that far from the real story. Okay. The real story is <laughs> that the guy turned in the script that was not good enough, and we had a conversation with him, and we – sort of like diplomatically read him the riot act and said, look, man, you're really talented. We know you, you know, you can do better than this. You have to treat these characters like they're your own characters in the stuff we read of yours that convinced us to hire you for this job. Go back to the well and make it better. And we gave him some particular, you know, specific notes also. And then the second time when he rewrote it and turned it in, like Cy described, it still basically sucked. And then we spent the weekend, but it was a long weekend. The, we had the Monday off also. It was some holiday weekend. Oh, I remember it, being holiday week? Oh, because you had to, yeah. I remember being particularly pissed just because both of us had kids and fam we were both married. And at that time, our kids were young. And it was like I was supposed to spend a holiday weekend with my family. And the two of us literally woodshedded in the office like Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. We split the script up in, in half. I rewrote half of it and he rewrote the other half and then it was ready to go like that Tuesday. Or How does that whatever. work though? How do you guys maintain the same voice synonymous through a script? Well, remember, or not remember, I'll just say at that point, we'd already worked together for like more than a decade, for like a decade and a half. And everything that we write together, nothing leaves our office until both of us have read through it and sort of like stamped it with, yeah, that's good to go. If he does something on his own, because most of the time we don't split stuff up like that, but, right. but we do driven by schedule or whatever logistical, you know, details, turn it into having to work that way. Um, and if he writes something without me, I'll read it and I'll do my pass and then I'll send it back to him so he can check it out and vice versa so when we started out we would literally write to get we would literally both be uh hovering over the computer or the screen and one of us would be typing the other one would be walking back and forth throwing out ideas or throwing out dialogue and then we'd switch off but we would literally be uh around one screen so we were generating the material together sort of uh, symbiotically in a way and then as we got uh more comfortable with each other's work and we knew each other's work more and then because when we started working in television there was always a much harder deadline than in features the features well, you don't really have that much of a deadline or you have a, a longer time to write your movie but in television 
if you're in production, you, you have a much harder deadline. So then just logistically, it became like, well, we can get more work done quicker and more efficiently. Generally, if we write scenes, not whole scripts, but like scenes or sequences, like, okay, Ethan, you go write that car chase. I'll write the scene where Connor argues with his dad, and then we'll we'll read each other's material and switch it back and forth. I'll do a pass on his car chase. He'll do a pass on my scene, and we'll talk about it. Maybe do one more pass, and then boom, we're we're on to the next thing. So we started working that way because, again, we became more uh, comfortable and trusting in each other's work, and then it again just sort of out of time and efficiency. Yeah, really, a lot of a big part of starting to split stuff up and sort of like divide and conquer material was driven by when we went into TV, we sort of like transitioned into television at a high level in television because we'd worked in features for a long, for some time and like sort of had some credits, you know, released and made a little bit of a name for ourselves. And then we wrote a pilot, we sold, a, we pitched a pilot that we sold and that we got to make and produce and then it got on the, the air like the first thing we ever did in tv so when we first entered the world of television we entered as i guess co-executive producers because we'd never run a show before and they gave us like a godfather to babysit us and officially run the show but we were still junior showrunners, and we were like the head writers and we were also involved in all the pre-production production and post-production so instead of just sitting at home in our like closets because that was the only space we could afford to live in writing a movie together we were like making a tv show which is much more time demanding and you know juggling a, a lot of balls and plates and keeping the plates spinning in the air and dealing with all the departments and dealing with the network and the studio and the actors and all of that stuff you know do you guys mind if i interrupt you real quick Sure. Can we just, can you introduce yourselves and who you guys are and what you guys do before we move on? Oh, sure. Because uh, okay. I didn't do it yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 15 Big minutes in. Up, Connor. <laughs> so, together, we're Reef and Boris, a writing producing team. We write movies and we create and run TV shows. That's Ethan Reef. I'm Cyrus Boris. Uh, like some of our movie credits, uh, well, probably most famously, uh, we worked on Kung Fu Panda. Uh, we also uh, worked on the uh, Ridley Scott Russell Crowe Robin Hood. Uh, back in the day, we wrote a, I think, much beloved horror movie uh, called Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight. With, with a K. With a, yeah, Knight with a K. Um, and then in television, we've done a bunch of stuff. We did... Uh, we did a series, uh, sort of a cult supernatural series back in the late 90s called Brimstone for Fox. We did, um, for Showtime, we, uh, this show, we did the show Sleeper Cell, which is sort of a, I'll say, a precursor to Homeland that got a lot of Emmy and Golden Globe nominations back at the time. And uh, we've done a bunch of stuff. We just came off of, most recently, we uh, were the American uh, exec producers on a Netflix series done in India called Bard of Blood, uh, a spy series. And we also worked on uh, History Channel and Netflix's uh, Nightfall, which was like a medieval Knights Templar drama. The second season of that show. Uh, Is that how you and Tom know each other? The History Channel? Tom. Dodge. No, 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 no. Tom, that Tom's just, that's just a person. That's just thing. your buddy, okay. Yeah, yeah, he's just the. Uh... But I know he was doing shows on history, right? History and discovery, discovery. like he was, he's more of a reality TV guy. We're all scripted stuff, yeah, so understood. So you guys are just West LA boys. <laughs> you mean me and and you Tom, and Tom? Yeah. yeah. You could say I know you're a recent transplant from Boston, so I don't. Everyone keeps using that damn word transplant. I don't. <laughs> recent immigrant from Boston. <laughs> immigrant. Boston prefer that. Immigrant. That rolls but, off the tongue better. Okay, for sure. So I give you props just for any specific knowledge of sub portion neighborhoods of greater los angeles or west LA. but you shouldn't say west you should say west side boys because like <laughs> where Cy lives and west la are both on the west side 
but Cy doesn't live in West LA. Oh, is West LA a specific neighborhood? It is, yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought that was just describing the general no, area. That's good. You see, you learn something new every day. Carly's looking at me like I'm dumb. Like. <laughs> but then well, you're new. You'll, at right some there. point, well, you're still young and cool, so it may take a long time, but you'll realize that the West Side isn't even really West because the valley where I live, which is the boring, domestic, semi, slightly, barely conservative, section of greater los angeles is north <laughs> of the west side so and that's so like why would the west side not be west well because it's only west of downtown la and in ah, the grand scheme of things right. the valley and the population there is actually just as significant if not bigger than downtown la maybe not culturally so this is your but all LA those studios are geographical there. lesson today, i thought i understood the map pretty well to be honest with you <laughs> I know Hollywood is pretty much central for everyone if you're coming from the Valley or commuting from our area. But I'm still not understanding why is the West Side not West? Because that well, touches west, the water. It is West. That's my Valley resident prejudice. Okay. <laughs> because it's, it's south of, of the Valley and the huge portion of greater Los Angeles lives in the Valley. And now, now, as longtime LA residents, what what's the best? I hate to be described that. What the first time anyone's ever described you? Yeah, that's horrifying, way. but it's true. I've lived here now longer than I've lived any place in my life. Longer than Cincinnati. Yes, longer than New York. Longer than any place. Let's just get into that. So, how did you guys meet initially? Oh, wait, well, finish your question. What were you? Well, I was going to say, can you name like a secret LA neighborhood that nobody would know? Oh, probably. Give, uh, give me like a really random one. One that nobody would know. Uh, Rancho Cucamonga. No, I've heard of that. But do you know anything about it? Could you point to it no, on a map? Could you thing. say anything that ever goes on there? It's not that people don't. A lot of drugs. It's not that people don't know <laughs> you the neighborhood. You can say that about every place. <laughs> it's just that you can find weird pockets of areas here. If you drive around and you live here long enough, and you go to enough parties or you go to enough. Well, here's another good one. Inglewood. Although yeah. now, because of the stadium, I guess that's not. You know, th yeah. This is the point. People know these areas, like have heard of them, but Wilmington, Wilmington. But you, 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 Corona. You wouldn't go there unless you 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 stumble. What one thing I do like about Los Angeles is that you can stumble on these weird neighborhoods that you never would have knew existed or or gone anywhere. I went to, I we went to a party once. Uh, we I dropped my son off at a, a theater downtown, drove like 10 minutes, and I still, honestly, it's terrible, I don't remember where we were, and we drove up this giant hill, and this party was at a house, like, on the top of this hill where there was like a, uh, there was like a, a, a road guard, and then after it was like a cliff, and then there were these little houses, apartments on the side of the hill, to this day, I don't know where the fuck we were. I have no clue. You were tripping. I, no, no. Okay. We were there, but it was like, and it was only 10 minutes from downtown. And it was like a, being in a different world. So I'm like, I have no, I, you know, I don't know if it was Eagle it's probably Rock. near, no, it was near, it it was was near Dodger Stadium. You were like uh, on your way to. Yeah, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. It was on the hillside. Elysian yeah. Park, some, some crazy place. But, yeah. but it, it was just fascinating because like, well, I didn't know this existed. I was driving downtown recently, and I drove past a building that was an indoor circus. People think I'm still crazy, and that I was tripping. This is not <laughs> true. This is actually, you can look it up. And I'm like, how is there an indoor circus in downtown LA? What's happening? But I mean, I think that's sort of interesting about this city is there's, it's so spread out. Like New York has got a lot of crazy neighborhoods and places like that, but it's much more, uh, uh, condensed, crushed condensed, together condensed, on top crushed of together. Crushed together, crushed together. together. Yeah. yeah, LA is like New York. If you took New York and squished it, and it got spread, spread out, it out all over the place. Um, but you were getting to our origin story, Connor. I don't want to know about it anymore. <laughs> I lost interest. <laughs> oh God. Okay. No. So I mean, I know you are from Cincinnati. Probably the first guy I've ever met from Cincinnati. And you were saying you're from New York originally. I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah. So where you guys met in college? We didn't. We did, and we didn't. The thing is, we met at NYU Film School, but we were never at NYU Film School together. There was a, we had a mutual friend who was in my year, which is one year behind Sai's year. And he was in some of my classes and he worked with Sai at like the Copy Center, I think. Yeah, NYU Copy Center, Student yeah. Copy Center. And that I told guy, Stephen King how to get to the bathroom once. Really? Because he came to an NYU event and he was lost, and I was sitting there at the cops. <laughs> hey, it's Stephen King. And he said, like, 
oh, where's the bathroom? I'm like, oh, right this way, Mr. King. <laughs> Wait, you actually physically led him? Yes, that was the highlight of my wow. work at NYU Copy Center. That's amazing. Zero, um, making Xerox copies. So this mutual friend of ours threw a graduation party. And he invited me, because I was a classmate and buddy of his, and he invited Cy, because he was also a buddy who he had worked with. Even though Cy had graduated and actually gotten a job in the industry. Well, sort of the industry. I, I, I got No, a, don't be so modest. No, it I got a job working on an animated cartoon series that was like the only show like that being done out of New York. Like like nine hundred percent of those shows are done out of LA. It was, it was Rangers, something It Rangers. was the Adventures of the Galaxy Rangers. It was a space Wait, cowboy show. How did show. you know that? I was doing research, man. He oh. was doing his research. Okay. Uh, it was a space cowboy show and I got a job as a storyboard artist. And then I ended up selling them a couple of episodes, like writing a few episodes on the show. And this is at 23 years old. Yeah, yeah, right out of school. So you were in the mix right away. Yeah, but then, but see, it was just, but it was, a, it was fake because it was like, it was a free, like all jobs in this business, mostly, it was a freelance job. So I had this great gig for a year and then the job was over and then it was like, okay, now what? Because I didn't want to move to LA right out of school and get into animation because I wanted to write movies and TV shows. So basically I did my post-college, you know, fucking around, figuring out what I want to do a year later, basically in sync with you when you got out of school, Ethan. Yeah. But still, I mean, you dismiss it, you know, but it is, it was still a pretty serious coup, even more so at the, at the time before there was all the interconnectivity and you could live in Timbuktu and get a gig, you know, as a freelance uh, artist or, or, or writer um, from anywhere. But when I, when we hooked up, I, I think that job had finished or I was probably collecting unemployment. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a year after you had graduated right? or you were working at uh, fun to wear hell. Whatever. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Anyhow, what, that, but, so what was that initial at, meeting? Like we met at this graduation party. Okay. The thing that, is memorable from the initial meeting is that we were the only two guys or girls who we had met from NYU film program who were attempting to write traditional Hollywood feature screenplays. Because we were, neither of us were in, at NYU at the time, there was a separate department for screenwriting, like the, it was a separate thing. And if you were in the film and TV school, you might take you you had to take at least one class from the writing department but after that it was much more divided and NYU in the 80s was very much the independent documentary cinema verte experimental film school and you know it wasn't a traditional storytelling feature film place so what did people want to do at that time well, the, we, you had a couple of, you had like Scorsese had graduated. Oliver Stone. Oliver also. Stone was a screenwriter. Spike Lee, uh, Jim Jarmusch was a guy. Well, they were just starting to right. break Right, they were just starting we, to break. When so we were there. It was very indie. It's like you stayed in New York and you told your personal stories and tried to do, you know, or, or, or you went into documentary. In fact, I have a friend from film school who never left New York, who's a, a very successful documentary film editor and producer now. And it isn't like we had anything particularly against those genres or those people. Some of them I had a lot against, but that's a separate issue we don't have to talk about. It was just, it wasn't like our creative vibe. That wasn't where our souls were. That wasn't what we wanted to do, right? And then when we met each other, we sort of hit it off because at the time when we went to that party, we were both in the middle of the writing process for our first screenplays, feature length screenplays. We, separate projects. Yes, yes, separate projects. And what happened was we talked and it seemed like we had a, a lot in common and we made a deal that when we finished our two separate feature screenplays, we should get in touch with each other and trade scripts and read each other's scripts. Now, let me ask you a question. During this initial meeting, were you guys both inebriated? <laughs> no. Is that like a standard question that you ask everybody a, on your well, podcast? Well, I've been thinking recently, at least in our generation, most long-term relationships start 
when people are drunk. <laughs> I mean it. And I've been thinking, I'm like, I wonder if that was the same thing for our parents, or is this just a generational thing? I mean, I, I the parents, it, it might be the case more often than yeah, not, I but for us... It wasn't particularly the case. Also, this no, graduation. I drinking until much later. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> driven, he started drinking driven by the dynamic of our relationship. In, in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, not Hollywood, just me. But um, the, the graduation party wasn't that cool. It was, <laughs> it was literally held at the apartment in Queens where this mutual friend of ours still lived with his parents. So, it, oh. no, I, I mean, there was alcohol, I think. It was a whack like party. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Well, <laughs> very low key. Yeah. But didn't we also hook up at a, at a, a Mets Reds baseball well, game? Well, okay, this is what happened. We made this deal that, oh, we're both into the same kind of movies and TV, and we should, we should try and, and stay connected somehow. And we're both writing scripts. So let's read each other's scripts. And we won't scoff at each other for trying to do, like, Hollywood movies, you know? Um, and then we got back in touch with each other because we had both finished and he was, we were both baseball fans. We'd also found that out at the party and size from Cincinnati. So he's a Reds fan and I'm from New York. I was a Yankees fan, but this was before interleague play. So the Mets were coming to town or the Reds were coming to town to play the Mets at Shea stadium. So we made a plan and we went to see the Mets Reds game and exchange screenplays um, at Shea Stadium, and then really, so the but the well, real well, we read each story, other. No, but the yeah, big thing is we read each other's scripts, and we were both impressed by the other. Although oddly enough, we each had like one particular picky note about the one thing we really didn't like about the other guy's screenplay, and in both cases, it was the one one thing the other guy was the most proud of and loved the most. <laughs> really? Funny. Yeah, which is kind of fun. What were the genres of the screenplays? I wrote a sort of sci-fi action thriller, and I think you wrote a, a period, like a... a historical a, action. Historical movie. action yeah. thriller. Yeah. Um, but, the, but so the real origin, though, of us as a team, uh, we, had a, we had a mutual friend who was a little bit older, who was starting to have some success as a screenwriter. Yeah, he, he was a guy who I introduced Cy to. He came from kind of like a similar background to mine in that he was from Brooklyn and he had no connection via his friends or family to the film or television industry whatsoever. He was just a guy. But he know? was having to, he was actually having some success. Uh, New Line Cinema, which did all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, et cetera, they were based in New York back then uh so he was doing some work for new line and he was actually starting to make a real career as a screenwriter and uh he called ethan out of the blue because he had gotten offered some uh low budget uh there was some producer at sony and this was way back we'll give you the little how long goes this was like when sony was just doing uh hardware and suddenly decided, oh, we should maybe make content for our hardware and everything, and for video machines and VCRs. We should make movies that we could put straight to video. And our friend had gotten a call from uh, somebody working for Sony or producer looking for a, a low-budget horror movie that they could shoot very inexpensively for the home video market. And he was sort of beyond it at that point because he was working for New Line and making real money. He said, well, I don't have anything, and... I'm too expensive now, but you should call uh, this Me. young guy, this mm. friend Ethan. You should call him and see if he has anything. And so the producer called Ethan, and the way I remember it, or at least you telling me, is Ethan was like, well, I don't have anything sitting around on my shelf, but let me call my friend Cyrus. Uh, and Ethan called me, and we started talking, and we said, hey. How old are you guys at this point? 23, 24. I, I, I didn't say that. Because I would never say a tell a producer I don't have anything like that sitting around. Let me call somebody else. Wow. <laughs> what happened was the, the but the mute the guy the guy who I knew from who was a a little bit of like starting to be a mentor, you know, because again he he had followed a similar track and gotten successful. And like Sai says, he was too successful to do this gig. He called me and told me about it, and I called Sai because I knew I didn't have something sitting on the shelf that was perfect. And I thought maybe he did, or if not, what happened was I, I called him and we ended up talking for like an hour on the phone and coming up with a project 
that fit the requirements for this The point was we didn't have anything done, but we decided, well, this producer doesn't know that, so let's just come up with something over the weekend and we'll submit something to them as if, oh, yeah, this was just sitting on my shelf and it's perfect. So yeah, we so we got together that weekend and we sat down and we wrote this treatment for this movie and that was the first thing that we ever actually wrote, wrote together, together. Yeah. and we had a really good time doing it and it turned out really well and then is this the project that got adapted into the film you were talking about with jada pinkett smith that took yes, like eight years demon to night, make demon yeah night, year, demon years night. later like that, seven years later i so guess we wrote yeah. demon night as an outline treatment and uh turned so, it into this super low budget producer and he hated it he hated it terrible oh, it's just terrible thank god he hated it because if if he had made the movie, it would have been a terrible piece of shit. So, but what happened was we had such a good time writing it and we wrote this thing and it was like, okay, this is actually pretty good. We felt like we shouldn't just leave this sitting on the shelf just because this guy doesn't want to do it. We should turn it into a movie for ourselves, on, write it on spec, you know? And so we wrote this script and that was the first thing we wrote together. We had a, a friend of uh, ours, a friend of Ethan's named Mark Bishop, who worked with us on on that script and uh we yeah. wrote we wrote demon night basically and, and originally it the idea was that we would try to like sort of raise money and make it ourselves a la like the evil dead so a low budget and know, the movie. idea was that Sai and i would co-direct it and this third co-writer friend of ours named mark bishop would produce it because he was he he was just like a natural born producer. He like was you, really <laughs> he was really organized and um totally full of good shit. at good at good, good people <laughs> skills and full of shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was that was the plan. So that was the whole irony is that was the first script that we'd written to get we Did wrote you have together. any directorial experience? Just you, student films. Student films making students. I mean films. it was it was an ambitious dream, but you know, whatever. And then the joke is <laughs> also it didn't come true, right? <laughs> but the but the joke is that again that was the first script we wrote together, and then the joke was literally, I guess, uh, seven eight years later that was our first feature film that was the Tales from the Crypt movie. Also, it, it did get the minute we finished writing it, it got optioned. Now, because of the nature of the film industry, it was a free option. But it was still a real option with a real company, with a real producer, with a real contract, with a, a real possible chance to get made, which, which was kind of cool. Can yeah. we simplify that real quick? So essentially, you guys, this producer hits you up. He said, hey, we have this opportunity. I need someone to write a script. You guys write the script for the Jada Pinkett Smith movie. The first producer doesn't like it, but someone else likes it. Yeah, except it was a treatment. We didn't write the entire script for that guy. I okay. Think, you know, yeah. yeah, understood. And, and then again, but the thing to keep in mind is it's an overnight success that took eight years to happen. I mean, we, we wrote that script. I think when we actually wrote the script, it was like, I want to say 1987. And yeah, Demonite, it was it was eighty eight. Eighty eight, and Demonite 88. came out in 95. January of ninety five. Yeah, it was so, seven seven now, to eight years. Like so, what are you said, doing in this eight year period? Oh, dude, we were okay. That's a good question, and the real answer is a mix of things. Mostly, we were just working our regular scummy jobs, which Sai had a is more of a Renaissance man with other skills and talents. <laughs> Than writing so he had a higher level elaborate because i because i did artwork again when i was working on galaxy rangers i started doing storyboard art so i ended up getting into the kids wear business doing artwork for kids clothing i learned how to draw like ernie and bert and the sesame street characters yeah so i had but again, again it was <laughs> but, and, but it was not what i wanted to do but it was like okay that's an okay job and, and then Ethan, and I would know what's so funny. Sorry, to cut you off. Isn't your daughter designs kids' toys? Yeah, right? that's but true. that's his dream job. Well, yeah. So, so his daughter it, is you living it's genetically his dream. passed down. I think the art talent is genetically passed down. Okay. I think I do think that's probably true. And I was I was like building IBM clone computers in a warehouse by the river in Greenpoint <laughs> when Greenpoint was filled with drug dealers, not like. 
rich young bohemians you know i don't know you don't i'm unfamiliar with greenpoint yeah you you don't know new york right no yeah yeah. so greenpoint is a neighborhood now you probably have to spend a million dollars to live there i used to have to walk literally to this warehouse where every other day the drug dealer across the street would shoot his bb gun at our windows (laughs) and it didn't it wasn't dangerous because they were like very thick industrial glass windows no but it was it was still not cool you know um anyhow so i I did that and i and i worked in like a way hang on for eight years no No, not we were were writing the thing is okay so so we were also because we had at least gotten encouragement on demon no. night because there were like this producer was a lot into it so we were doing rewrites for him we were uh writing other spec scripts no we also we came out to la we had brushes with breakthrough success several times we did a weird like we we came out here we did a weird uh we got a job rewriting a again a straight vex is back when the there was a big straight to video market so there was a there were actually jobs that you could get and and small studios writing, writing jobs cranking out these uh movies for the for the video market back in the in 90s and uh we wrote like an an, ins- an insurance fraud thriller <laughs> probably i will say the best insurance fraud movie of all time no the only it, insurance fraud yeah, movie yeah of all but time. So. that the cool the cool thing about that story is what happened was we had writ- we also wrote a couple of other spec scripts and they all got a good reception. And we were both in New York at this time. But that friend of ours, who was more successful and a little bit older, had relocated to Hollywood. He lived in, he lived in L.A. And he was sort of starting to live the aspiring Hollywood screenwriter dream life. And he, we sent him our scripts. And he would pass them around out here. And they would get really good feedback. People thought our writing was good. But that didn't immediately translate to like a job opportunity or a check or anything and the the cool story about the insurance fraud movie is that friend passing our scripts around got us a manager a guy read our scripts and thought oh these guys might have a commercially viable future and i can make some money off of them they're cheap and he called us in new york and said hey i want to represent you guys and we're like "Uh, okay sure cool and then he got us by turning our material in at this studio, small studio that doesn't exist anymore, he got us a chance to audition for that job. To pitch to for re- that. To pitch, pitch for, for the job of rewriting this insurance investigation movie that the script had been written like years before and the company wanted to put it you know, on the fast track and they wanted somebody new to work on it. And we both... Flew, we flew from New York to LA on our own dime. On our, yeah, sitting side by side because like the FedEx had just arrived with the scripts for us to read. And we were literally like reading the scripts that we were supposed to pitch to rewrite in the car and the cab to get to JFK and then talking about what were we going to do on the plane. And then the, the manager picked us up in his like little Porsche, his little old Porsche at LAX and drove us straight to Hollywood and dropped us off. And we walked up and we went into this conference room to pitch for the gig. And I don't know about size memory. I haven't talked about this in a long time, but it was one of the greatest like experiences of my life because I felt like after we were done and we left that room and the guy, the manager drove, you know, picked us up and drove us to like some sidewalk cafe to like hang out for a while and like cool down and have a drink, whatever. And I felt like, there's nothing I could have said to make it any better. Like almost every conversation you left it all on the table. Yeah, almost every conversation <laughs> left it all on the field. <laughs> almost every conversation in my life, I always felt later on looking back, like, oh damn, I should have said this, or I should have said that, or I should have not said something else. And I felt like we had just sort of like nailed it. And I remember I, I I was already married. I don't know if Cy was married, but he was already with his the woman he was he married. Dating the woman I and I remember I didn't have a cell phone. This is like the early 90s, but the manager guy had a cell phone. He was like Mr. Hollywood, you know. And I remember I borrowed his phone and I called my wife back in New York. You said, honey, I killed it. I, I said, <laughs> I said, I don't care. Like, it would be great if we get the job, but if we don't, there's nothing we could have done to make, to improve our chances. So whatever happens, I'm glad, I'm glad we came out here at least. 
And we got the job. We were out here for around six weeks working on this movie. Who was the studio that bought this? It was a very. It was called uh, Chuck Freeze Entertainment. Freeze Entertainment. They owned their own building in Hollywood. Um, in Hollywood, yeah. like they were. But again, back in that time, and I think they did television also. But again, the this this making movies specifically for, you know. You probably remember when you were a kid, the going to the blockbuster yeah. when you were a kid, and that was a big deal. The straight to video market, you know, they had they had real movies, but then to fill up those video stores, right? The studios only release a couple hundred movies a year in total. So to fill up those video stores, they were buying. There was if you were a low budget producer or or you're a smart producer, you could make movies and just distribute them straight to the video <laughs> store and you can make real money that was like a real industry for but years. the funny the, and it was good for young people breaking in yeah. because they cranked out a lot of products so there what was, was the budget on the insurance movie well it's probably a, i don't know maybe what? back in those days like two million dollars yeah or something. i mean so it's not a tiny no 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 robert davi when the, when the movie actually got made robert davi who you might not know his name but he was in like the original Die Hard movie and he's in you know, show a lot of stuff. He's, he's, he's like a character actor. He's always a bad but, guy. Pockmark skin. But to put it into its proper context inside L.A. or Hollywood, when we were done in that right. conference room with that, with that pitch for the gig, one of the guys at the table was one like the, the son. One of the executives was the son of Chuck Freeze. He was like Chuck Freeze Jr. And he was like, this tall, handsome, blonde surfer guy with like really long hair and a beard. And I'll always remember, he sort of looked at, I guess it was like our, our, our bios or something that the manager had prepared and given to them. And he looked at it and he looked at us and he was like, did you guys really come out here from New York just for this? <laughs> and we were like... There's no good way to answer that question. This piece of shit. You know, like, but at the, time, the was answer was yes, but there was like yeah, any opportunity, like we're we're there, you know, we'll do it. But he didn't so, say he didn't say it like, wow, that's cool. You have so no, much ambition like, or crazy. It was just like, what's wrong with you? You know, but, so are you we, so pathetic? We were in that LA for six weeks. We did that do. gig. We Real did... quick, but before you guys do the insurance movie. <laughs> so after you guys had made that initial script, were you guys always communicating back and forth like, yo, we got to break in. We got to yeah, get out also, there. Yeah, also, like I said, we had written, in the interim, we had written two other Feature spec films, features, spec script. which we sent to that guy who became our manager and which made the rounds. That's the way it used to work here. They made the rounds and started to get read and started... To I make our still, name, it still you know, that a, way. a little just, bit known. They make the rounds on electronically as opposed yeah. to people passing. It happens way faster. Well, the thing that yeah, I, that's I think, that's the thing. I think it's much more, you know. The thing I, I think I mentioned, you know, I always tell young writers or, or people, it's like you've got to get just the hustle element is get anybody you know to see your work, get anybody you know to read your script. The, re the reason something happened with Demon Knight is because our friend Mark was – babysitting for uh, a, a wealthy lawyer in the Upper West Side or something at the time. And Mark uh, was reading the script while he was babysitting. The lawyer said, oh, what's that? He said, oh, my friends and I work in the screenplay. What is he? He says, oh, it's this horror movie. And he says, hmm, is it any good? And Mark's like, yeah, I think it's really good. And the guy said, oh, my brother's a producer out in uh, L.A. And he's looking for a, a small budget movie. Uh, can I send him that script? I was like, yeah, sure. Okay. And that was sort of like... Cy, Cy, Cy forgot this part, which he probably doesn't remember, which is the reason our friend Mark had the job babysitting there is because a friend of his who was a woman and a classmate our age had ma and at NYU Film School had married the successful lawyer oh, <laughs> and wow. had the, the baby. Connections. So that but was... the point being, that's why it, he was was like there. A, it was a fluke thing. It was just like, he's reading it and then he gives it to somebody else to read. And that guy says, oh, my brother's a producer. I'll give that. So that type of thing is, you know, you just have to get, if you make short movies, you have to get people to see your movies. If you write scripts, you have to get people to read your stuff. Obviously, you hope it's good, but and you hope people respond to it. But it's really... You, there's just so much uh, – there's a lot of hard work, but there's also – what I think people don't want to admit, there's also a lot of luck involved, you know, because you can't control luck. I mean, 
I, I, I like to feel in some way, shape, or form that script was really good and would have gotten where it gotten where it got to eventually anyway. But even even honestly, even the origin story of Demonite getting made was a similar thing like Ethan and I talked about. So what does that do you, for your career? When it got made? When Demon Knight huge. is out, what no, happens to no, you No, that was huge. It wasn't even when it was out. It was when it got greenlit and they were to be it. a yeah. studio release. Universal is, is producing it. It's like a 12 to $15 million budget. It has real actors in it. It's like a real movie that's going to get How do your lives release. specifically change? I mean, that's a good question. It... We got more meetings. We got more job opportunities. There was more interest we actually, in our original scripts that we had written. I think, in fact, one no, of the we other get one on. We got on. We got through the door. Yeah. When when Demonite was chosen to be the Tales from the Crypt movie and oh, be released by Universal, we got through the door to the studios, which was a different league from the league we'd been operating in for those intervening like seven to eight years, which was low budget companies but before before moving on to how our life changed because there was some no, no just hang on the thing about the work like Sai said oh it's a lot of that was luck which is there's there's truth to that but the work part the thing i want to touch upon is that one of the advantages of us being a writing team and having two of us instead of just one of us alone no matter how talented and hardworking the individual writer is he's talking about me of course <laughs> is that all of our material before going out into the world to the people who would judge it and their judgment would really matter because it was like are we throwing these guys names in the trash because this work sucks or are we gonna remember them and file it and maybe think of them for the next job or maybe even consider making this before our work got to their desks to read, it had to get through us. And the thing is, you know, first draft theater, a lot of material suffers from belonging in or being categorized as first draft theater, meaning it might have a great idea, it might have some great characters, it might have some great dialogue, it might have some great action scene description, but it doesn't have all of that stuff, you know? And you have to be very hard on yourself if you actually want your material to be good enough to break out of the pack and get noticed and recognized as, holy shit, these, this person or these people really know what they're doing and we can take a chance on them. And because there's two of us, every word that we write, every scene that we write, and every script that we finish vetted. has to get vetted yeah. through somebody else's brain and eyes and I think that's a real built-in advantage. You know what you guys have that most people don't have, which is genetic, is taste. Something you can't teach. Well, and when did you realize you had that? I mean, I, that's I a very you, subjective... You can't acquire taste. Yeah, but the, that's I a very subjective like judgment. Yeah. We're, yeah, that's totally subjective. Also, I would say that the reason we work well together, that we're very different human beings, is that we share movie taste and drama taste and like like what well just we we, we well sort back of like back the when same we movies and we like the same tv shows and we were into the same writers and the same directors and i mean like give me an example yeah I, yeah so when we like the original star trek tv series right give me like a present the day 60s. Example. no no but i can't give you the a Bourne present day movies. example i mean, I mean no I no not the born movies we fucking met in 1986 yeah are you insane no i know but that's a, that's and, impossible and the born isn't very present no, day it's it's <laughs> yeah listen i'll tell you what but, are you watching right now no no but let's actually answer your question, even though you're not interested in the answer, because I am. <laughs> okay. So you probably never, you might never have heard of the director Richard Lester, and you might never have seen the Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers from the 1970s. Those movies and that director, who also directed, um, what's the Beatles? Uh, oh, Hard Days. Hard Night. Days That's Night. What he's famous for really. Music video. I mean, a movie. it's a movie. movie. Oh, there's a movie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm unfamiliar. Yeah. It's okay. okay. Those were not like the most well-known, most celebrated movies when we were coming up in the 80s, going to film school and trying to break into the industry. But when we met each other and just started talking and schmoozing about what kind of stuff you like and what kind of stuff you like, it clicked, yeah. we both loved the, those movies. I'll give you a perfect example. Everybody loves Halloween. 
the original Halloween by John Carpenter. Ethan and I happen oh, yeah. to love Assault on Precinct 13, which is John Carpenter's earlier movie that he made. So, I mean, it's easy. He doesn't for, know either of those films, but it's it, just it, fine. It, I know look Halloween. Them up. They're great. Yeah. Well, yeah I know Halloween two, three, right, four, five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. But see, he, he made an earlier movie that's a great low budget thriller called. Kind of like a, an urban action. Right. It's siege basically movie. people trapped in a police station with like every gang in LA trying to fucking kill them. And it's a great low budget thriller. And so it's, it's, it's that thing of, you know, the taste is totally subjective. That's the toughest thing about any art form or uh, creative, endeavor. creative endeavor is that there's a certain craft level that you have to achieve and past that craft level, it's all subjective. You like one movie, I like a different movie. Doesn't mean those two movies aren't made by talented people that know what they're doing. It's just that, you know, I mean, once you know how to direct or once you know the basics of, of writing, like you can structure a story and create characters, after that point, it's all subjective. So the thing about the Richard Lester movies that I was mentioning is that they were this odd, successful mashup of genres and tones. Because they there were three Musketeers, right? So you know it's going to be like a high adventure, swashbuckling, swashbuckling action movie. But they also were funny without being like just joke comedies. They were funny, intentionally funny, not like, oh, it, it's ridiculous and we're just going to laugh at it. Funny where they wanted to be funny. And they also were kind of like, kind of edgy histor view of history that gritty. was kind of original and very gritty, you know? And they combined this sort of naturalistic humor and this real gritty, intense drama and life or death stakes. That was a very strange, unusual mix. And they were commercially, they were hits. But they were still kind of like outlier, you know, outlier movies. And we both really loved them. So that was sort of like, oh, destiny. There's something, you know, there's <laughs> so, yeah. Destiny. There you go. Well, that's actually an I want to just speed us up to like more present day because it seems like this is all 80s and 90s. Um, so the Jada Pinkett movie drops. You 95. Guys start, you, that was 95. So you guys start getting flooded with opportunities. Now, after that drops, you guys can become full time writers, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's and true. so what are you writing about? Two or three scripts a year? Uh, yeah, I think it depends. We, we hadn't gotten into television yet. We were still doing primarily features. Basically, we didn't want to turn down a gig, but we didn't want to become hacks. That was the dilemma at that point of our, that phase of our careers. And if we got a job opportunity that we connected with and thought, oh, this is cool. We can actually like, do our best and believe in what we're doing, we would take the gig. If, and then, we, if we didn't, we would, you know, we, we wouldn't. And then we got and, But you guys are pitching yourself as partners, correct? Yes. And then we got, got into it. television. Yeah. No, we were an entity. We were, we were, we were known in the we marketplace as like, oh, these the duo. guys. Right. Yes. Got it. And then we got into television. And the great thing about television is that feature films are, is still really controlled by the stars and the director. So... If Ridley Scott wants to make a movie next week, he's got a pile of scripts, he'll find something to make. If Tom Cruise wants to make a movie, he'll find something to make. In television, the writer, now it's a hip turn term, it wasn't a hip known term back in the day, but is the showrunner, right? So the showrunner is in charge of the scripts in in Well, it was even more so the case when we broke into right, television. In television, the script and the writer is the most important element. And the reason is because television you're cranking out multiple episodes you have very uh certainly back in the day you had very stringent deadlines and so the joke was always like well, we don't care who's in it or who's directing it we got to have something to film because we got to put a show on friday we got to put a show on friday night so the so most constant work so yeah but again but the point the is the most important thing is the script, is the script. but the, so there the, thereby the most important element in television the writer. is the, the writer. writer but there is there there is a shift that's taken place since then. Cause that was around the year there was in the late nineties and the year 2000, when we sort of like changed over from movies only to TV and running shows and creating shows. And that's more than 20 years ago. And the difference is now that most shows are not on networks. Most shows don't Streaming, have to be delivered yeah. 
for a deadline of production in advance. Now, it's more like, for better or for worse, it's more like the movie world where the company with the, with the money and maybe the big shot producer really has much more of, of the power than they used to in terms of creative content, you know, because they'll take as long as they want until they feel like, you know, they like the material or it's the right time in the marketplace. And unfortunately, unless you're a real superstar, like a Shonda Rhimes type of, you know, creator. Created Grey's Anatomy. It, it takes, it's taken some of the creative power away from people like us, you know, from the, the writer yeah, show. Some, I would say some of the bad habits of feature film have have snuck over into television because of streaming. Bad habits well, from the writer's the, POV. It, the content is different now. People, essentially, a lot of these shows are shooting a 10-hour movie, correct? Yeah, that's true. I also think it's interesting. I was looking at, uh, at and we're doing this in, uh, in uh, summer of 2022. They just announced the uh, Emmy nominations. I was really happy because most of the nominations for best series are uh, original series. And what I mean by that is they're not based on a book. They're not IP. They're not based on another movie. They're not based on – it's not 10 different Star Wars shows or 10 different Marvel shows. It's an idea that somebody came up with originally and got made and is on television and was successful. That's a rarity – it's almost it, it almost doesn't exist in feature films now. Almost every, at least on the studio level, almost every movie is franchise. Has, yeah, it has some sort of IP. Mm -hmm. It's based on a comic book. It's based on source material. Source material, source material novel, of one kind or, or remake, another. A reboot. A now it could be based on a podcast. Yeah, exactly. It's true. But and, and we do a podcast thriller. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll hire you guys to write it. But see, that's a shift in the industry that's happened while we've been working that is, it, it's funny because we're in the midst of uh, pitching a series now, and we have, we actually have a, a, a couple of things we're working on right now, and all three are, I would say, original but IP adjacent. One is original, but uh, we're working with an actress and incorporating some of her real life experiences into the project. What does that mean? Like it's original, but IP adjacent. Well, this is what I'm trying to say. It's like, it's like, they're all basically original, but when you go into a studio, you can say, Oh, but this is based on this actress's life. So it's like, Oh, okay, great. It's got, it's got some, uh, because the public knows a little bit about her life. Well, it's more like the buyers know that, Oh, this has some sort of, uh, Legitimacy, Legit pre-existing pre legitimacy. legitimacy in some context, which makes the executive who might buy pull the trigger to buy the project feel like oh, it has a better chance at le commercial legitimacy. There's IP, there's yeah. intellectual property connected. It's not totally original. So similar to like that Nick Cage movie that's like s semi autobiographical. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Well, that's, that's what was that called? Un un well, yeah, I mean, obviously, to, uh, mass that's a in, in a way, yeah. in it's a way, not... that's a perfect, a perfect thing to bring up because that movie would not exist under any version or form without Nick Cage, right? Yeah, exactly. Pick any other actor, it's not going to work. But see, but, here's yeah. the, point, the point being, it's original, but it has, it's IP adjacent because, oh, we're taking Nick Cage and we're making his life sort of like this. The other project we have, one of the other projects is based on a kid's book. Now, the show is not really a kid's show and the kid's, the book was very uh it has short. no story and no character so we had to create everything so it's original but when you go to the buyer you say oh, i've got this best-selling book that it's based on another project that we're working on is based on a, a newspaper art an article from a real event that happened like years ago so even that and it's an original and we've sort of created all the characters but you could say oh this is based on there's this newspaper article this is something that we've had to i think um because Ethan and I, almost everything we've done in our career has been original material. It's been ideas that we've come up with ourselves. And now because the business has shifted towards having these branded franchises and, and having these uh, source, material. source material, because studios and networks and streamers are nervous about doing something that's totally original, we've had to pivot with that. And we're sort of trying to have our cake and eat it too. 
Like I said, it's all IP adjacent. The truth is every one of those ideas we're working on now is basically an original idea, but we've got elements of uh, source material woven through each of them so that we can say to a buyer, oh, relax, you're not rolling the dice on something totally original. This is actually based on somebody's life story. Or this is based on a newspaper article or this is based on a kid's book. So that's very much where the industry is right now, which was not true when we broke in. I mean, and, and look, the whole joke is Star Wars is, a, is, a, is massive intellectual property, but Star Wars was an original thing when it came out, right? And Star Wars would never be made today because people would say, oh, it's too expensive and it's, it's all these new ideas. What are we going to do? <laughs> it's too risky. That's the thing. The business has become much more risk averse than it was, I think, when you and I broke in. Do you mind if I cut in real quick? Sure. I want you guys to look closely at my hand. Yes. That was a karate chop because we're speaking of IP. Would you guys mind explaining how you guys came up with the idea for Kung Fu Panda? <laughs> oh, yeah, we can do that. Well, um, this is the thing. Kung Fu Panda, the title, the name Kung Fu Panda existed in an office at DreamWorks Animation. That was all that existed. DreamWorks Animation loved that title. And I give them a lot of credit because that title, that title in and of itself is fucking amazing, right? DreamWorks Animation spent a year with their story executives and in-house sort of like story department, which every animated studio has, working up material and trying to figure out what should this Kung Fu Panda movie be. And they never got to a place on their own that they were comfortable with or happy with. And after about a year of that, they started talking, calling in different writers in town to have conversations with them about Kung Fu Panda. We want to make a movie called Kung Fu Panda. What should that be? And because we had written a script that had a lot of positive buzz around town uh, called Bulletproof Monk, the movie came out. Movie was okay. The, the These guys love that movie. Oh, that's great. The movie was great. The movie was great. But the writers always feel like the movie's not as good as their script. Well, <laughs> anyhow, it was a very hot property, that screenplay that we had written. And on the strength of the Bulletproof Monk screenplay, having Asian and martial arts elements very much in the forefront, we were called in and we had a meeting with DreamWorks Animation. Wait, let me just back yeah. up. The, the thing is that... Ethan, so here's the, 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 I'll call it the Chinese connection. When I was a kid, I was a huge fan of uh, kung fu movies and martial arts movies. Um, years later, when we were in college, uh, all these uh, great Hong Kong movies, Jackie Chan movies, Chai and Fat movies started coming over to New York from uh, Hong Kong, and we would go to Chinatown in New York to watch these movies. Well, it was a little later. It was when Cy and I had already met and started right. working together. We used to go to Chinatown, and we'd and be like the only two foreign devils in the Chinatown movie theater. Yeah, right. The, <laughs> right. the only exactly. two white guys. And, and then uh, Ethan uh, ended up going to China uh, to work on an NYU grad film and actually met his wife. And so, but, so, so I guess the, the reason I say this is because by the time – we're going into DreamWorks. Ethan and I are are both pretty well versed in Asian culture and also those type of movies, the martial arts movies, the kung fu movies, those type of action movies. Yeah, and I had lived in China for a while, so just other aspects of Chinese culture and Chinese life, you know. So we were the I, perfect I familiar with guys when DreamWorks. Now we hadn't written a kids movie really before, but. Um, we went in and we had this meeting and the, all they had was the title and we basically went off and we came up the character of Poe being this, you know, fat out of shape Panda who is a huge fan of, of martial arts and everything. And he desperately wants to be a martial arts hero. That's very much inspired by, there's an old, old, old school Jackie Chan movie uh, called drunken master where 
He's the guy that works in the Kung... He, he sweeps the floors in the martial arts studio and just wishes he could be a great Kung Fu hero. So that was sort of the inspiration for Poe. And then the Furious Five that we came up with is basically... Again, it's low-hanging fruit if you know anything about martial arts because all the martial arts classic styles are based on animals. Well, Chinese Kung Fu Chinese Kung Fu styles are based on animals. So there's like, you know, tiger style and mantis style and uh, snake style. And so we were like, well, it's a cartoon, so let's just make those actual... There's a tiger that does tiger style and whatever. And so... And then even the villain from uh, Kung Fu Panda, uh, Tai Lung is named after a Hong Kong movie star from like the 70s and 80s that we were big fans of. So we were just like the perfect, it was just sort of this symmetry that we talk about luck, you know? It was like, we were like the perfect guys because they, they had this title that was a funny title, but they didn't really know what to do with it. And we were just the perfect guys at the perfect time to come in and say, oh, here's what you should do with this movie. So I left out this one aspect, which is they had this meeting with us to just talk about where they had got with Kung, the title Kung Fu Panda and sort of like read us in on the program, so to speak. And they gave us like a binder to take with us to go off and work on our pitch. And the binder was the result of the previous year of in-house development. And it basically had like, a breakdown of every Kung Fu, Hong Kong, Chinese Kung Fu movie Japanese ever made, movies. every Japanese samurai ever made, and sort of like an encyclopedia of Chinese wildlife. <laughs> so it wasn't very, for, 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 for our, from our POV, it was like not particularly helpful or useful the in terms of the narrative or the characters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, it, there was some use to it, but in that sense, but um, it, we were able to just sort of like make it our own, you know. Um, but So I grew up playing the Kung Fu Panda video game. Awesome. On Xbox. <laughs> Loved it. You had to like get yeah. the rings, destroy the boxes, beat up the oxes. Yeah, now, do you guys have creative games. oversight on all those properties? No. Yeah. As well? well, this, okay, this is the that part of the story. And it's sort of like a double-edged sword. On the one hand, DreamWorks Animation paid us, when, when, when we came back and pitched them something they loved and they bought it, or they said, we want to buy it, or they called our agents and said, we want to make a deal, this is great. There's always a negotiation by like the business affairs department at the studio and your lawyer, you know? And they paid us well, like upfront, the deal we made was a good deal, right? But the fine print of that deal, which we had to sign on to in order to get the gig, was that because it was an animated movie, it did not fall under the ages or the guidelines, the rules and regulations of the Writers Guild regarding profit participation. And in place of that, DreamWorks Animation drew up this thing called a schedule of bonuses. And what it meant was if the movie went forward and act, we wrote the script and they liked it and they made the movie and it got released and started to make money in theaters. It was huge. When, I mean, we didn't know, you, you never know. It's always a dice roll, You never right? know if anything's going to be successful. But when that happened, instead of getting the built-in minimum percentages of profit, that the Writers Guild requires that writers get for real for live action movies. In place of that, like there was this schedule, and it said when the movie makes two hundred million dollars at the box office, Ethan and Cy get twenty grand each, and when the movie makes two hundred and fifty million at the grand, box office, no, Ethan no, and Cy get fifty grand each. And the, the point of this is there's an incentive system. Yeah, well, but, but yeah, you're but saying it's, it's a bonus. But the thing is, you don't make any. It's in not the animation. You don't make any big money creating. And, and I would say so. So the, people the, say like, "Oh, did you guys get screwed? You created Kung Fu Panda." I said, "Well, guess who else got screwed? The artists that designed all those characters, uh, the guys who directed the movie. You know, it's feature animation. And and honestly, and, and an animation historian would go into more detail on this. Feature animation has traditionally not been covered by the same." rules of live action filmmaking. And it really goes back to Walt Disney, who was a uh, 
an, a, a virulent anti-union guy and, and felt like he created this thing. And so it's basically all his. And, and so traditionally, it was actually interesting. Traditionally, and to, to some level, Pixar still does this way and Disney still does this. They have writers in-house. They have people on staff at the animation companies and artists that are really good at story. And so a lot of these movies are developed in-house. When Jeffrey Katzenberg left Disney to form DreamWorks Animation, they did that. But one of his ideas was, well, there's all these really talented screenwriters in Hollywood. Let's also try bringing in feature film writers to develop. They have good ideas to, to do stuff. So that's even why we got in the door at DreamWorks to do this project. So, but you don't get rich doing feature animation. Yeah, the thing so is essentially that, though, that, you, that you guys, skid, well, I'll just, just let me add no, one you thing. You don't have any creative no, but control. The, the schedule of bonuses, that ended up being like pennies on the dollar for our profit participation if it had been what it would have been. Considering, in a live action. But you guys don't get a royalty percentage of like all the merch no, that's sold, no, the no, video we games, the no, concerts. No, no, we don't get no, not anything for Kung from Fu that. Panda. But on the other hand. Now, would Jack Black work out a deal where he gets a yes, piece of all that? He probably I think, the, I think that's how they started getting. The big one was they got uh, Robin Williams to do the genie and Aladdin. That was the first, like, we're getting a big name voice actor to do this. And I think even then. He didn't have that deal and then retroactively because he was starting to say hey guys the genius yeah there's making dolls and all kind yeah. of stuff yeah but and that's and when you retroactively made that deal. when you're a superstar you can make them do whatever you want them to do in order to sign a deal i remember but the ip is important it came from your brain no, it though. did but listen this is the thing they still had the title right and i remember this is the first time Kung Fu Panda was the first animated project we ever worked on. And I remember our agent and lawyer calling us because we had held a line about, no, it has to be a writer's gift. Give me a break. We're like established big time Hollywood screenwriters. We can't just sign on just, you know, because of the money. And basically it was, they're not going to budge. This is it. This is, this is their precedent. If you guys don't want to work outside the writer's guild authority, they're going to move on and find somebody else. Did you, you got finessed. Finessed. <laughs> no, look. But, but, do you guys get pissed about thinking about no, that? But, but, no, wait, no, but no, but the other thing. No, sorry. Do, the the wait, thing is, but really there quick. was. There's there, also the thing I want to say is, it's easy to say now. Guess what? We wrote two or three other animated features. Well, but that's the, None of them got made. So you never know in this business what you... It, if anything is going to get made, if it's going to be no. successful. Listen, the thing is, know. a lot of... Even though... There's the potential for us to see the revenue streams that we have no part of that Kung Fu Panda generated and be frustrated by that. Kung Fu Panda had a really positive impact on our career. Oh, yeah. Number sure. one, like Sai just mentioned, DreamWorks hired us to do two or three other animated feature projects, none of which, unfortunately, for various reasons, ever actually got made, but which were all pretty cool and we enjoyed and we got paid well yeah, to write a good them. company to work and, for. And also, really good. it was great for our careers because our name was connected to that movie when it finally came out. And that movie was, you know, beloved and for good reason, because I think it's probably the best movie our names is on. Yeah, actually. The, the truth is you, you've got, you know, you can't i mean that's that's you trade off the like quote unquote back end percentage points to like oh your name is on a massive hit movie that everybody knows so like for the rest of our careers that's on our resume we you know yeah. we wrote kung fu panda and you know you go into a room you're with, that guy you're yeah, yeah exactly. panda guys. So that's, i mean it doesn't hurt you know, you know it doesn't hurt we've we've made a lot of money off of that being a credit, a successful credit. Understood. Since then, so you know. So, I just got a five minute warning. There's a couple things I want to go over. We're gonna do quick hits on these. <laughs> okay, yeah, ready? We'll try. Go. You guys are good storytellers. Um, all right, I have them in my notes, so I'm just pulling that up. Okay. Okay. Real quick, um, I'll tell you a quick story. My first day out in Los Angeles, I walked to Jerry Bruckheimer's office, yeah. and I try to get him on the podcast. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> His secretary said, dude, what are you doing here? You can't just show up. I was like, all right, my bad. Was this She's in like, Santa Monica? Yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah. get out of here. We're releasing Top Gun in three weeks. 
what was that like working in collaboration with him? Huge fan of all of those films. Oh, with Bruckheimer? Yep. Yeah, we, we did a television series. We, did we had TV. a really, I think we both had a very positive experience with Jerry Bruckheimer. I'll tell one really short What anecdote. was the system like? Do they no, work well, fast? I mean, or? What was the system like? It's no, not different from this. I mean, it's he a has, system. He has a TV. He has a the feature, same as every other production. He has a feature character. department, and he has a TV department, and he oversees everything. But he has people that work for him. I think his television, you know, because of C the CSI franchise was hugely successful for a long time. Um, but, but he was personally involved. He'd call you every once in a while to say, oh, you know, can you put a little more action in the next episode? Or, hey, you know, and you. you and that's that it's connected. What's special, maybe what's special about his system is I think Jerry Bruckheimer, despite now being filthy rich and incredible, one of the most successful people in the history of Hollywood is still at heart a pretty decent human being, right? And maybe that trickles down into his system somewhat. And the story that I always remember is, like Sai said, we worked on this TV show for him. And it didn't work out. And we got this phone call because the reason it didn't work out, even though the, the studio loved it, the network loved it, and everybody wanted to charge forward, but he got a call from a different studio which was his movie studio, Disney. And they said to him, you can't do this. This like interferes with it's too similar something to that we're franchise doing with you. that we have going or whatever. And that was after we had worked for like, I don't know, a year maybe on this project. Developing this pilot. For and him. we got a call. We didn't know any of this. And we got a call at our office from Jerry Bruckheim. And we picked up the, you know, we put him on the speakerphone and he basically explained the situation and said, I'm sorry, guys, it's my fault. And I'll always remember that because, yeah, we were successful guys, but we were like piss ants in the Hollywood compared power structure <laughs> compared to Jerry Bruckheimer. He didn't even have to, you know, he could have had his third assistant executive give us that news. Just say, but, oh, the project's off. There's some conflict. But he took the personal responsibility for what happened and so instead of remembering it as god damn we wasted a year of our lives even though we got paid i remember it as you know he's a, he's a good guy we did another series from after that but yeah that even story we had done a pilot for jerry that uh we had worked on for a long time and i guess he had he had at some point they had decided it was too close to the National Treasure franchise that it was in some similar modes. And yeah, and Jerry called him up and called us up himself and said, look, guys, I'm so sorry. This is my fault. I should have flagged this from day one. And, you know, I really I can't I can't go up against Disney and, and they're right. It's it's too many similar elements and whatever. And and that's the thing. He would call you personally if there was any. And, and sometimes he would just call to say, like, Hey, I really like this week's episode. Uh, you know, keep on doing the good work. You know, I mean, he he would just weigh in once in a while, and you'd get that uh, that Jerry stamp of approval or something he would complain about, but it would be a very soft, personalized. Like, you know, yeah. yeah. You three, who's got questions? You got a mic, Carly. I want you to ask one. This is good practice. Thank you for being patient. I'll make this quick. Um, quick hits. Quick hits. Yeah. Seems like you guys can like pretty seamlessly uh, jump into different genres of like films specifically. Um, which one are you most drawn towards? Ideally, if you could write in one genre. Huh. Oh boy. That's a tough question. That's a good. That's a good question. I would say an action thriller that's grounded in some real world thing. It's funny. A series that you talk about what we watch. I think I showed that we both have watched. Though we ironically didn't watch at the same time that we both really like. Uh, is Narcos on Netflix. Like, that's a show I watched, and I was like, yeah, Ethan and I could have done this show. This would have been a great show for us to do. Because it's, um, again, it's an action thriller, but it's grounded in real-world stories and real-world characters. I mean, we love everything. We've done horror movies. We've done family comedies. We've done martial arts. We've done sci-fi. We've, we've, we've never done written a romantic comedy. Yes, we've never yeah. written romantic comedy. That's the one thing I think we would fail miserably yeah. at. <laughs> Kyle, or Carly, Carly, you got it. She's eager. What is a one-liner piece of advice you would give to somebody trying to get into the writing space? Oh my God. 
She's a natural. She's built for this. I, I would I would go back. One line. I, okay, I'm going to preface my one line by saying it's going back to something I touched on earlier. Read your own work and be merciless with it. Yeah, and I would add, yeah. you can't be get anybody, once you finish writing and it's good enough, then you have to put on your hustle hat and get anybody you know remotely connected to business to read your work. Anybody that offers, because again, you just don't know, you're babysitting for a lawyer whose brother's a producer, you know? All right, that was about seven lines, Cyrus. Kyle. <laughs> I'm just going to cap it up. You guys answered a lot through that whole thing, but I just want to compliment you on Bulletproof Monk, especially. I love Punk and Panda, but I've seen that thing like a hundred times. That's awesome. That's great. Dude. That's, great. <laughs> that's great. He was saying, Thank he was saying you. that. Thank you. You made yesterday. my day. That's, that's really cool. Thank you. Okay. I want, I want to do one quick comparison. Whose zombies do you like better? This is, this is from Demonite. That's my zombie. <laughs> Break it to you, Connor. I'm gonna well, get... your zombie's better built. My, my zombie's <laughs> fucking jacked, man. Look yeah. at that guy. Besides, the, the, the demon knight, they're not zombies. They're, not they're zombies, demons. They're demons, they're yeah. demons man. It's, it's That's what my girlfriend origin. calls me. She calls me a demon. Oh, for real? All right. Well, kind of. That's better than a zombie. <laughs> I, I'd agree with that. Now, are you guys writing a, a new Karate Kid? No, no. Yeah. We wrote... there. Uh, we did write we a wrote sequel, an to the sequel to the Will uh, to the Will Smith the, produced Karate Kid. Jaden Smith, Jaden Smith, Smith Karate Kid. Jaden is now too old to be the Karate Kid. <laughs> uh, but That's, we did write, we did, yes, we wrote a sequel that never got made. Oh. That's an that's great IP. There's an interesting story to that, but we won't tell it now because there's no time. I understand. If, if I own the studio, we could talk for three hours. But there we yeah. go. Anyway, um, this is how we start in the episode. Thank you guys, by the way. I hope you had a good time. Yeah, oh, thanks, yeah. Connor. Thanks for having me. You're very us. welcome. Thanks for having me. And us. thanks, Connor's crew over yeah, there. Yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> you guys had great stories. Now, this is how we start in the episode. I'm only going to say it once. It's for, pre it's for post-production. One of these statements is placed at the start of an episode. One of these statements is placed at the end of an episode. I'm going to have you do the first statement. I'm going to have you do the second statement. Okay? I'll explain. But I'm only going to explain once. So listen intently. You have to say, hi, your name, and this is my golden hour. Directly after, no break, you have to say, hi, your name, and that was my golden hour. Oh, so I what is the beginning and what is the ending? Exactly, and I would slate t towards the camera as you do it, because this is like your money shot. Okay, do I, what do I have to do the like this? No, just slate as in like, turn your head towards the camera. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, brethren. Hi, my name is Cyrus Boris, and this is my golden hour. Hi, my name is Ethan Reef. And that was my golden hour. That was so beautifully executed. <laughs> Everyone messes that up. All done. Thank you, man. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks a lot.